All right, well, good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending on what time zone you're in. Welcome to our San Jose State University iSchool celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month uh, and the Symposium uh, on Hispanic and Latinx Library Services. Uh, my name is Dr. Anthony Chow. I'm the proud new director of the San Jose State School of Information. And as a first generation uh, American born son of immigrants, I'm fully committed to all things associated with equity, diversity, and inclusion. And now truly understanding and not merely tolerating our nation's unique diversity truly paints the profound and beautiful tapestry that ultimately defines who we are as Americans. This symposium will be the first of many that the iSchool will sponsor as part of our commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Special thanks to my colleagues, Drs. Kristen Redman, Michelle Villagran, and Alfredo Alcantara for their hard work and support in making this symposium happen, uh, and certainly all of our distinguished guests uh, that you will hear from uh, shortly. You'll see on our agenda that we have, we will have a keynote address followed by two panel discussions. Uh, also, our proceedings today will be recorded and widely distributed via our YouTube and social media channels afterwards. Our theme today is making vital connections, understanding and serving the Hispanic Latinx community. Now let me introduce our outstanding keynote speaker, Dr. Jose Agunaga. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jose Agunaga received his EDD in educational leadership from Northern Arizona University. He also has an MPA from uh, California State University, Long Beach and his MLS from the University of Arizona. Uh, he first joined the Academy in 1994 and has worked for close to 12 years uh, as library faculty at Glendale Community College. He's currently the branch coordinator at the North Campus Library. Uh, he is also a fellow Spartan, a member of the iSchool for the past two years, teaching Info 210, uh, which is our reference and information services course. He's been actively involved in professional library associations and higher education uh, throughout his career. Uh, and has served as vice chair, chair and past chair of ACRL Community Junior College Library section. Uh, at this time, he's also serving as the chair for the National Council for Learning Resources, an affiliated council for the American Association of Community Colleges, and also co-chair of the ACRL Diversity Alliance Task Force. Besides his actual involvement with organizations, he's also presented and published uh, Dr. Agunaga's most Recent chapter publication is from 2018, entitled What I've Learned from the Past, Present, and Future, uh, in the ed edited edition by uh, Teresa Neely and um, uh, Jorge, Jorge Lopez McKnight in Our Own Voices Redux, The Faces of Librarianship Today. Uh, on another note, uh, uh, Jose is an avid San Diego Padres and Chargers fan. Uh, he is a native Californian from San Diego. Uh, although he now resides in Arizona. And finally, uh, he currently is a candidate for election to the ACRL Advisory Board uh, uh, for 2022-2023 uh, for Vice President and President-elect. And lastly, Jose's higher education philosophy, I got this from your LinkedIn page, sir. I provide for the development of students, staff, faculty, and the general public. Uh, he's also dedicated to encouraging the ongoing success of BIPOC in completing their higher education goals. So join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Agu Naga. Thank you, Dr. Chow, and thank you to uh, Dr. Redman and Dr. Villagran for uh, offering me this opportunity to uh, provide a story where, where I've come, where I come from and what I've been doing and how I think the theme for my my brief talk today is how family is a vital component and how I connect and always remember that I'm Hispanic, Latino, Chicano, and a little bit of Basque involved. So just to give you an overview of my career path, what you see in, in the background with my virtual background is the actual library where I work at in Glendale, Arizona. Uh, thankfully, we are now under 100 degrees, actually under 90 degrees, so we are very grateful for that, for that wonderful weather. But um, to get back to my story, I must always be thankful and grateful that I had a wonderful mom who's no longer with us, and also a wonderful abuelita 
and of course my dad. The three of them were able to inspire me, but also to keep me on track with my educational uh, potential. Um, I grew up in San Isidro, California. If those of you that are from California may know where San Isidro exists, it's the last city before you go into Mexico, Tijuana, Mexico. And growing up in San Isidro as a, in a section eight apartment complex uh, taught me many valuable lessons, but also made me remember to remain humble, to be appreciative of the opportunities, but also to continue moving forward. And just to share a, a small story about living in, in the apartment complex, having that family, not just blood relatives, but having, having the neighbors that were also an extended family for us, that really resonates in my mind and in my life and in my practice, not just as a librarian, but also as a human, um, being grateful for that. So if you wonder, how did I get into the field and how do I tie this in with our month? This is the end of our month of Hispanic heritage. I was reflecting on that and it, it dawned on me, my first summer job when I was in the ninth grade was working at the local branch of San Diego Public Library, the San Isidro branch, just by shelving books and understanding the value of the library that I think that began the growth and planted the seed in my mind, but also it made my mom and my, my grandma quite proud of what I was doing in that I was with, with books. I was learning. I was learning the value of information at that young age. After spending that summer there, um, then completing my high school years, I moved on to um, the university. I went to University of San Diego, uh, Catholic University in San Diego. And this is where a true uh, valuable lesson took place. I was not prepared. My study skills were not up to par for the going from a high school to the collegiate level. And after three semesters, I was academically disqualified. So talk about a, a, a hard lesson. But thankfully, I had faculty at the University of San Diego that encouraged me to retreat and go back to a community college, which I did. And that was in Chula Vista at Southwestern College, completing that journey, getting my grade, grades up, fulfilling what I needed to do, and then reapplying to complete my study at University of San Diego. I completed my bachelor's with a, uh, a degree in international relations and a minor in Italiano. So talk about uh, romance languages, a beautiful language to, uh, to know and to uh, practice. Um, that's where the next chapter of librarianship took place. My last two years at University of San Diego, as part of my work study assignment, I was assigned to the library, the undergraduate library. And by uh, working there, I worked with the reference librarian. Mr. Devin Milner became in many ways, a, a first mentor that guided me and planted the other seed to think about graduate school beyond completing my undergraduate degree. He, uh, he would always find time to talk to me to give me some ideas to, hey, what are you thinking about? Do you love working in this kind of facility? Well, what about a career? So uh, having said that and graduating from University of San Diego, the family practice continued with Mr. Devin Milner. He, uh, he stayed in touch with me as I ventured into the business world. My first career path was working with Ford Motor Credit Company, the finance arm of Ford Motor in Pleasanton, California, up in the Bay Area. As you might imagine, that wasn't my cup of tea. I was a customer service rep and dialoguing with individuals that were, let's just say, um, I had to remind them of their monthly obligation um, instilled a, a different type of education for me. I, I heard many colorful language uh, used when I was talking with them. <laughs> so after two years, I decided going back and forth to San Diego to visit my mom, my grandma. I decided, what do I really want to do? And I had a meetup with, uh, with Mr. Devin Milner, the reference librarian. And he encouraged me at that moment, you need to consider applying for graduate school and become a librarian. He supported my applications um, with great reference letters. And 
After four years with Ford Motor Credit, I was accepted at University of Arizona and talk about a new adventure. I had never lived out of San Diego. So by living up in Pleasanton, that was a new experience. And then traveling and residing in Tucson would become another rich experience that would be a, a just a great moment, not just for myself, but for my family, but also my development as an individual and a future information professional. So going through those kind of experiences has certainly given me an opportunity to understand the value of librarianship, but also as an information professional and understanding that there are always individuals that are looking out for you, trying to help you out, but taking their information and then putting the effort and also the initiative to succeed um, is, takes, takes some time at, to say the least. While at the University of Arizona, um, I was there for a period of 18 months, completed my degree, but while working there, I had another experience. I worked at the, at the main library at the University of Arizona as a library skills uh, assistant. Um, I shelved books. I gained additional uh, experiences, additional contacts, but also you'll find this interesting. If you, you know our wonderful, wonderful founder of Reforma, Dr. Arnolfo Trejo, I worked for his Hispanic books distributors as a part-time cataloger and having conversations with him during the brief time that I worked for him, his, his uh, outfit was quite valuable. Uh, I recall his style of being somewhat quiet, but also very with profound advice regarding the profession, the career path, and also paying back to your own community in many ways that you can. The other experiences while at the University of Arizona, continuing with the theme of family, familia, I became a member of Reforma. I joined Reforma with the student chapter that Mr. Uh, Bob Diaz at the University of Arizona is still there. And um, I joined that chapter and I'm glad I did. because That was another rich experience to also to understand how librarians that desire to help out their own specific community can do in many ways. I joined ALA and just as a matter of a coincidence, I just renewed my ALA membership and I realized this is my 30th year as a member of ALA. And then obviously I've joined ACRL and also the state library associations where I lived in my career path. So after graduating from University of Arizona with my MLS, I once again took a chance and I ventured to talk about creating new family connections. I moved to the state of Texas Houston, Houston, Texas. My first career um, uh, opportunity was at the University of Houston, and Ms. Dana Rooks served as another wonderful mentor in this process. I was hired on a two-year temporary position for social sciences. So talk about taking a chance, not knowing what the future would be. But within that time period, she gave me an opportunity to uh, oversee the human resources uh, factor of the university library. I became the coordinator for human resources involved in recruitment, retention, uh, and training of the entire library staff. Talk about a, a leap and uh, a great opportunity to be involved. While there, I was a librarian also for uh, Mexican American studies and Dr. Tacho Mendiola, who was a director at that time, he provided very insightful, deep insights from an academic point of view, but also from a humanistic point of view regarding the community of Houston and also the many, the many issues that in some ways still remain in our country. So going from Houston, um, I went back to my alma mater at University of San Diego to join the library there to now as a professional, as a librarian. And that experience was also insightful and I must go back in my story here. While I was in, in, um, in Houston, uh, my, one of my classmates also relocated to Houston and we had a deep friendship that eventually evolved and we got married. And uh, so we, we became the married couple and out of the cohort from, from the library school, there were about 10 of us and I believe three or four marriages developed from <laughs> library school. So uh, talk about a, uh, having double librarians in a, in a family. Um, so 
going from California and then um, transitioning to other aspects, when I was at Cal State Long Beach, another opportunity, I was once again a social sciences librarian, but my last year at Cal State Long Beach, not only did I complete my Master of Public Administration, but I also was able to um, live on campus the last year. My wife and I have lived on campus. They had a program in the dormitories, faculty and residence program. If you contributed 10 hours of assistance with student work and so forth, they would provide free room and board. So talk about a learning experience, learning from the actual students happening, what's going on in their own personal life and uh, assisting them with their own research. And after a while completing my MPA, the, the book planted in me that I was really engaged in the academic study of public administration. I wanted to pursue a doctorate. I applied at various universities and I got accepted at Arizona State University. After one year at Arizona State University, it was not a, a, the right fit. And that happens in life at times. So I continued working and I was now working with the community college, Glendale Community College. And that has been a tremendous experience helping students that want to do something with their life, whether it's to get a certificate, career skills, or pursue it beyond the associate's degree. So those experiences have really inspired me and always have reminded me to connect with family. Family goes beyond the members of your house or your blood relatives. It continues in your life. And that's something that keeps me connected and keeps me humble, but also grateful that I'm living this experience and I'm finding ways to continue to contribute back to our community, but also to honor those that have come before us. So that's just my, my brief story of what family and how family connects by being Hispanic, Latino, Chicano, Mexican-American, the whole gambit. So I appreciate your time. If you have questions, if we have time, I'd be happy to answer some. If not, uh, I'll be hanging around to uh, be with uh, the rest of the program. Uh, here are our wonderful panelists and our students that will be providing a wonderful presentation during the student showcase. Thank you. Thank you, Jose, uh, very much. So our next um, uh, panel uh, will be uh, led by uh, Kristen Redmond. Kristen, go ahead. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you, Jose. I connected so strongly with uh, everything that you said about family and familia and just the power of stories and, and how you overcame challenges. And I think that's so much, you know, for our community, understanding how to overcome challenges is not always visible to everybody. And so to have people talk about how they overcame uh, whatever they were experiencing academically or professionally, I think is really uh, rich and, and really helpful uh, to have discussions about that. So thank you. Uh, and I'm glad that, to hear that you're interested in, in joining with the, with the panel discussion that's coming up next. We have a, a panel of four, uh, five, uh, including you as you stick around, uh, which is related to diverse uh, voices of the Hispanic Latinx community. And I'm just going to introduce everybody uh, and, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more about uh, questions. Okay, so our first panelist is our very own uh, Dr. Michelle uh, Viagran. And she's an assistant professor, and but she uh, is also an accomplished educator, as we all know, an innovative speaker, entrepreneur, consultant, uh, and really has deep, deep expertise in cultural intelligence and diversity and inclusion uh, strategic initiatives. Uh, Dr. Viagran uh, earned her doctorate of education in organizational leadership with uh, her dissertation focusing on cultural intelligence in 2015. She also received uh, a few uh, awards very recently and has just been a leader in our school um, in the area of leadership 
in service and leadership in diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. And so I'm, I'm really proud to have her part of this panel. Uh, we also have Martin Gomez, uh, who's president and CEO of uh, MJ Gomez Associates, LLC, an independent consulting firm that was created to support the work of libraries and nonprofit organizations. Uh, so the focus of his firm is to help organizations renew and refine their priorities through strategic planning, organizational assessment, resource alignment, and executive recruitment and in coaching. And, coaching. and so he just has a really deep expertise uh, and a strong leadership background as well. I, wel I welcome you, Martin, and I'm just excited to have you here. Uh, he holds a Bachelor of Arts in English from the University of California, Los Angeles and received his master's in library, and science, library science from the University of Arizona, where he received the 2001 Outstanding Alumnus Award from the College of Behavioral Sciences. So such a rich, deep background. Next, we have uh, Max Macias, uh, an independent award-winning librarian, author, educator, consultant, and speaker. I can't say enough about how much uh, Max has done to support our school and to raise our visibility in the area of equity, diversity, and inclusion. So I'm so happy to welcome uh, him. Uh, he earned his MLS from Emporia State University in 2009, and he has some special academic interests in the realm of culture and information, uh, hip hop and information science and teaching, uh, cannabis and libraries, as well as teaching in general. And he's very also, like all of us, so committed to family and enjoys spending free time with his wife and his three children uh, in the Northwest. Uh, we also have uh, Rosa Rodriguez, who is the Outreach Coordinator at the California State University of San Marcos uh, University Library, and she's a first-generation college student working towards a Master of Library and Information Science at San Jose State University. Uh, she also has a Master of Arts and Sociological Practice from Cal State San Marcos, uh, and she has a background in community outreach, library programming, uh, event, uh, event planning, bilingual services, and working with Spanish speaking communities. Uh, she's the current president of the iSchools Reforma uh, student and alumni group, which is fabulous. She's just such a leader in our program. And so I'm just so happy uh, to welcome her. She's got some uh, fabulous things to share with us. Uh, so, and of course we have Jose sticking around, uh, who is, by the way, I should mention, uh, a uh, candidate or for vice president, president elect, in spring 2022 for ACRL's board of directors. And so hopefully um, everyone will take note of his name. And again, I wanna thank him for the wonderful uh, story that he shared. So welcome panelists. We've got a couple of questions uh, relating that we thought the structure of the panel will basically be able to talk about. We'll kick around a couple of questions. I'll pose a, a question to the first person and then hopefully open it up to uh, feedback from everyone who wants to chime in. And if, as time permits, hopefully we'll have some uh, time for questions over time. Okay, so the first question, as to Michelle, Dr. Michelle Viagran. And so we felt like, you know, we, we talk so much about identity and the way that we express our um, Hispanic, Latinx, uh, Chicanx for some of us uh, identities and these terms. So how can we define, uh, I can't think of anybody more qualified to define these terms, Hispanic, Latinx. So can you tell us more about those terms? and? And how are libraries key players in supporting uh, the Latinx community and, and thinking about those identities and serving those identities in our community? Sure, thank you, Kristen. And while this question could be a, a whole webinar, all day topic, a, a seminar in itself, but I'll give the quick 101 around these terms that will hopefully help us in considering each of these uh, different terms. So historically Hispanic, I'll start with Hispanic, uh, is used to identify those whose heritage ties back to native Spanish speaking countries. Uh, if we look at the Oxford English Dictionary, for example, OED uh, defines uh, Hispanic as quote, Spanish speaking, especially applied to someone of Latin American descent living in the United States. And 
uh, this term Hispanic has been used officially to identify Spanish speaking people since the 1980s. Now the word in and of itself uh, is a reminder of European colonization and the actions against uh, indigenous peoples in Latin America. So there's some controversy in utilizing that term only alone. But now if we think about Latino or Latina, uh, this refers to those that have ties uh, to the Latin Americas, uh, Central America, Latin America, uh, Spanish Caribbean areas. And these terms actually emerged in the 90s. So pretty recent, not doesn't go back further than that. But Latinx, so this is a, a term we're using today. It's a term that we, we are seeing a lot of, um, really embraces, I would say, the uh, inclusivity of identification of Hispanic and Latin ethnicity, even uh, cultural identity. Uh, and it moves away from the feminine masculine dichotomy of the Latino Latina. Uh, so inclusivity is really the key when you think of Latinx. Uh, and it's been morphed over the years. I think Latin with the, um, like the at symbol, Latin a, that was, and it morphed into eventually the Latin with the small X and then the Latin with the large X. Where the large X, it removes that, again, the restriction, I would say of the O or the A, and then offers that wider uh, or broader per, uh, perspective or even spectrum of identities. And it first appeared actually in 2004, if you look in the literature. So it's pretty recent, um, though I thought this was an interesting statistic. Uh, Pew Research, um, they did some research around uh, looking at Latinx and Hispanic. And according to Pew Research, only about three to 4% um, say that they actually use Latinx to describe themselves. Um, and there's been an increase if we even look at the Spanish language where Latinx L-A-T-I-N-E, Latin or Latin, which is also gender neutral. And it flows more if you're a Spanish speaker than the Latin X in speaking Spanish. Now, these again are all identifiers or um, I don't like the term labels, but labels around ethnicity, around our cultural identities. And however, or no matter which term or terms you utilize, they are representations of who you are your culture, your background, how you identify your experiences and form a broader part of your identities and even the intersectionality that might come in with those identities. So when we're speaking about these, just these two terms, we'll say Hispanic and Latinx, they are very broad and it's a very broad community. There's diverse needs of each of the communities. Uh, so we have to take that into account. Now, Kristen, you asked about um, libraries and the roles they play. I have a lot to say on this, but I'll make it short. And I'm sure the panel and those attending can also contribute here further. Um, when I was posed this question and thinking about it, I think part of our job as librarians, uh, as faculty, as students even, as parents, um, we're really here to help equip the next generation with the um, expertise, the resources that are needed to um, help the next generation be better, be smarter, be more culturally competent. And I think libraries play a key role here in, we'll just start with literature. Literature is a great example. So literature or library resources, databases, all play a significant part here. Literature offers, again, stories we talked about right in the beginning with, uh, with our keynote from Jose. Literature offers a way to open our eyes and open our minds to the world and a way for us all to learn about even complicated topics or maybe topics we don't necessarily understand or know a lot about, such as Latinx heritage or even topics on immigration. And even libraries play a key role in offering these resources for native speakers, so materials in Spanish and in other languages. Um, so many things libraries do, offering paths to citizenship, um, helping, again, with language support, housing, um, they're also key players in supporting that path to information literacy. And I think the huge role of being a, we'll say sanctuary or even a space or a place for those entering, those new Americans that are coming into our um, communities, being that place where they can go to have the support, have the resources and feel welcomed. Uh, there is a great piece uh, from American Libraries uh, in 2014 that was published about 
uh, strategies to reaching out to these communities. And I'll put it in the chat in a moment. But we have to remember that Hispanic and Latinx communities, going back to my earlier point when talking about the terms, are very diverse in it, each of these communities themselves. So librarians are really trying here and are helping to close the gaps by working closely with their communities and even partnering for outreach, programming, and other aspects. So I'll add that in the chat. And Kristen, thank you. I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Michelle. That's just really uh, some lovely perspectives that you're sharing about language. And we talk so much about language in the courses that I that I teach about how we think about uh, communities and how we serve them. So much starts uh, with um, dignity and the dignity that we want to uh, extend to the communities we serve. And that much of that begins with uh, language and how we leverage language in uh, strategic ways. Uh, so I appreciate uh, everything that you said. I know that we, with our, you know, thinking about programs and services, you know, there's there's very traditional ways that libraries, uh, if we think about the history of libraries um, emerging and developing over time and serving diverse communities, and that a lot of what we've done over the years is uh, people are rethinking it, uh, how to uh, be more strategic and relevant to community members. And so that's always at the forefront of my mind as well. Uh, did anybody else want to chime in on any of these issues of language? Uh, there are some other terms like Latinidad, you know, and issues of solidarity in our field. And I didn't know if anybody on the panel had any perspectives on that. Max, do you, you sounds like you want to jump in. Yeah, I'd just like to say that, can you all hear me? All right. I'd just like to say that uh, we, we, we shouldn't neglect our indigenous heritage as well. I haven't heard much of that in this in this and it's very important it's so important that that it's directly related to the whole immigration debate right and i think we we ought to uh really uh beef up our indi indigenous uh speech about speaking about indig indigeneity and how that relates to the freedom of an indigenous people to migrate on their own continent and and that's very powerful so yeah just just that I, that's all i want to say awesome beautiful talk beautiful uh, stuff michelle thank you yes that's something that's definitely a part of my biography with having uh, uh native backgrounds and how that's negotiated uh in terms of identity and so you could when you when somebody asks about your background you can say so much about uh you know, our identities and how they're sort of um, intersecting in lots of different ways with lots of different communities and uh, negotiating with the language around uh, uh, indigenous perspectives. So, you know, in, in native perspectives. I mean, uh, even, so even, even the yeah. term Latin, Latin yes. America, right? Like even the term Latin America takes away from indigenous America. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't really use the term Latino uh, because it's it, Latino to me doesn't mean from Latin America. I study Latin, right? <laughs> I know where Latin comes from. And what exactly. the word means is, is, you know, somewhere, some people who speak Latin, they come from Europe. So like in, indigenous Americas is, is what I would say, but, but awesome. I agree with, with everything you said, pretty much it's, it's great stuff. This is, we could have a, a, a full semester. Just talking. on the language and how not to erase folks. Yeah. Does anybody else want to chime on some of these issues of language and the way that we talk about ourselves, which I think is so, so important. So our next question that we wanted to pose to the panel is primarily posed to Martine. And I wanted we wanted to talk more about the challenges uh, that libraries face and effectively serving uh, Hispanic, Latinx communities. And so how can libraries and communities work together to help, help solve these challenges and problems? And so that's always something, a big issue that we that we face in, in the courses that we design for students. Uh, we can talk a lot about 
you know, community scans and asset mapping and, uh, but we really struggle to um, communicate to students those challenges and what they're going to face with, as new professionals. So I don't know if you can say a little bit about that. Well, thank you for inviting me here, uh, Anthony. And uh, there, were, there was a note, by the way, in the uh, question and answer about the, the um the um, article being av available through chat. I don't know if they fixed that or not, but there was a question that people couldn't see the chat. So just to uh, put that aside for a moment, uh, you know, having had the opportunity to be in this profession for, dare I say, over 40 decades, uh, four decades, excuse me, not 40, <laughs> four decades, you know, uh, I've had uh, a, a chance to have a front row seat in many cases and in other cases a, uh, uh, a, a back row seat to some of the things that have gone on. Uh, like Jose, I uh, uh, I'll spend a, a lot of my career in uh, uh, public libraries, primarily well, not in the San Diego area. And uh, uh, I remember back in the day where uh, uh, having uh, been hired as the first librarian of um, uh, Hispanic heritage in the San Diego Public Library, just before Prop 13 passed, um, there was the whole question was how do you get uh, Spanish books into the collection, and you know it was like a, a no brainer in my mind because uh, hey uh, there's a place called Tijuana it's about you know 15 miles away and we went and set up a, a channel there but you know I had the biggest struggle because the policies and the acquisitions department from the library didn't have them set up as vendors you know you had to be part of the vendor program and it was you know look, anyway we ended up solving that problem. But it was like those challenges then, I think, um, in some ways still exist, you know. Uh, but I do think in terms of immediate uh, challenges for uh, libraries, you know, I mean, you can't ignore the pandemic. And, and that's, you know, a challenge not just to uh, our community, but um, in the, all of society at this point in time. But in, ter in particular, you know, um, we struggle a lot just to be able to conduct effective outreach to Spanish-speaking communities, to uh, uh, people who are uh, uh, young Latinos who are in school, who maybe don't have the benefit of um, you know, working with, um, uh, using our uh, public resources like libraries. So just reaching them at, at a normal situation. So that's been aggravated, of course, by the pandemic. The other thing I think is uh, kind of a more immediate is that, you know, in some ways, a pandemic is um, an opportunity for us to uh, take more risks and to reinvent some of the uh, approaches to library service. You know, this profession, I, you know, uh, you can slash me if you want, but I think this is a very conservative profession and we need to be uh, more uh, uh, willing to take risks in the profession. I mean, uh, <laughs> I couldn't believe when I was in uh, Logan Heights that I had a chance to meet with the library director at that time, who we ended up getting rid of eventually. But uh, uh, to be able to, you know, uh, have an audience with somebody at a high level in the organization after having just basically gotten out of library school and presenting my case about getting Spanish language materials in the, in the, in the library collection. But, you know, I, I think more uh, often than not, uh, we need to be able to take more risks in the profession and push the envelope. I mean, we, if we're good at what we know about ourselves and about our community, we know where those community needs are. We also, you know, should be in contact uh, with our community. And so how do we match those two, uh, two things? So one of the things I, I thought a lot about is um, how we reach out to Latinx communities. And the, the challenge for us, I think, is not just how, but um, with all the technology, with all the, um, um, oh, uh, you know, the, the uh, avenues, uh, we still struggle on, on how to do that. And I think that one of the big things that we need to think about doing as a library profession is getting more involved with uh, those who set policy in our libraries, in our communities, and uh, in particular at the uh, state, local, and federal level. I mean, uh, one way to do that, of course, is uh, to get involved with the boards, to help uh, on uh, elections, to work for elected officials on a voluntary basis, to possibly even run for an office yourself, to be a uh, member of your library board. Uh, there are all, all these ways, but the policy is really where the rubber hits the road. We also need to take a look at developing um, new leadership initiatives. 
Uh, I'm proud uh, to say that I was a member of the first generation of GLISA that was at the University of Arizona, the Graduate Library Institute of Spanish-speaking Americans. And when you think about it, I, uh, I was um, surprised, maybe I shouldn't have been, but at one time in California, we had three graduates from my class running some of the largest libraries in California. Luis Herrera was running the San Francisco Public Library. Uh, Jose Aponte was running the San Diego County Library. And I was running the Los Angeles Public Library. And all of this goes back, frankly, to uh, uh, Arnulfo Trejo. Jose mentioned him earlier, who was in many ways uh, a, a visionary leader in his own right. He wanted to make sure that we had opportunities uh, in our community to be able to represent, to serve, and to provide the leadership. So, you know, the challenge I think for us certainly is to provide greater leadership development opportunities. We also have a responsibility to mentor the next generation of library leaders. Early in the day, as I mentioned earlier, the problems or concerns or challenges for us were about collections and, you know, uh, library employees and workers who were bilingual, bicultural. I'm not saying we've solved that, but we've made a lot of progress. And I think the things we need to do now is really focus on mentoring the next generation of leaders, as well as developing our initiatives at the higher levels of either academia or government, all those policy areas. So, um, you know, we're always gonna have challenges, but we need leadership to be able to uh, address those challenges. Thank you, Martine. I, those are just fabulous perspectives. And so much of what you said, um, I think is reflects, uh, even just with collections, just taking collections, for example. Uh, I, I see hundreds of students every, every year. I mean, they come to me, they're excited. They want to design for uh, diverse communities and they start developing the tools to, um, you know, do these innovative things. And then I say, okay, have you done an audit of your library's collection? Tell me about the audit. And that's, you know, I want you to do that. And they go and they do their audit and they come back and they said, there's no books in my library. I, I want to design this beautiful guide for my communities and there's no books. And I said, I know, I know. And so it, it's still a big issue. Uh, collections, 100%, 100%. And it's still a big issue to uh, for communities, our leadership to recognize the that there, we still have a long way to go. When I was early in my career, um, I um, had uh, a, a chance to, and by the way, um, people need to give other people opportunities and chances mm -hmm. you can be seen and be heard, right? So uh, when you're in a uh, higher level position, you know, I can't encourage people to do that more often than not, but I had that opportunity. Uh, Brooke Sheldon, uh, a library leader back in the day, invited me to speak at a, a conference and I got, uh, you know, uh, first it was very nerve wracking for me, but in the end, you know, it, it got, it gave me exposure to a lot of different uh, uh, folks and ideas. And, uh, the um, one of the folks that I met was a person who was a, um, uh, uh, a staff member at the Kellogg Foundation. And, uh, you know, she said to me, you know, how can we help you? And at that time, I didn't really have a good grasp on, you know, uh, and it, long story short is that she gave, I was uh, at the time president of Reforma and she granted uh, us a uh, small grant of what seemed like a lot of money to me, uh, $15,000. And we use that money in Reforma to create something called the uh, National Report Card on Library Services to, to uh, Spanish-speaking communities. And that publication now is, you know, probably lost. Uh, it's probably, you know, 40 some years old. Uh, and maybe we need to do something like that again. You know, I could see a foundation or the IMLS or somebody funding to kind of give us a snapshot of where are those challenges? What do we need to do next? What progress have we made? Mm -hmm. I love that those ideas. Uh, it sounds like Michelle has some other perspectives, but that kind of got me excited about thinking about uh, formal structures for auditing programs and services. So important. Go ahead, Michelle. <laughs> I just wanted to respond to that to let you know, Martine, that that is in progress. We actually, um, there is a new 
uh, Reforma National Committee, uh, the research committee, and I am chairing it. So we're formulating this fall and we will start doing really researching the trends and what's been going on in our communities and hopefully producing a biannual report um, and other publications. So that is in the works and um, we'll have more information hopefully by next year. That's great news. Anybody else want to chime in on some of these challenges? COVID, of course, is a huge challenge. Uh, a lot of my work has been in digital equity and, you know, a lot of people are cell phone only. They don't have broadband. How do we, you know, there's, there's a lot of solutions out there that you can try, but if we don't have the backhaul to propagate, it's hard to create new community spaces and a lot of uh, libraries that are under-resourced those are challenges that are remaining a lot. And so our, our new professionals need to be nimble and able to adapt, right? You know, I was going, going one of the posts that I missed in the chat box was from uh, Jillian and from our, our follow, the panel that's coming up. And she talked a little bit in her chat about the Filipino community also experiencing language issues. And so this is something that uh, professionals uh, of color, uh, community members of color are having to negotiate uh, and with the issue of language and identity and the expression of that in a, in a complex culture like what we're living in. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, so our next question is actually to Max. And we talked a lot about serving communities. But I always tell my students in, in the class, we not only are serving our community members, we're serving each other too. And the treatment that we give to our colleagues uh, is so important to reflect on and to be uh, uh, prepared to do well. And so some of the biggest challenges facing Hispanic and Latinx information professionals uh, is giving voice to the pushback we face and recognition as well as representation, okay? And so in the workplace, uh, and we've there's lots of misconceptions and assumptions people have about uh, communities and their colleagues. And so how do you, you know, can you share some of the observations uh, of what folks are facing, professionals uh, or anyone, and ro what role you see that maybe some of the act activism-centered movements uh, might play in improving things. This is something that for those of us who have been in the field for a while, uh, the activism uh, that is so important and is gaining steam again, sometimes I, I find that it ebbs and flows. So maybe you, I, I would love to hear your perspectives on these issues. Yeah, um, thank you. I feel very honored to be here. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, great question. Um, wearing this t-shirt today black panther party you know they tried to start up at merritt community college and they were thrown out that's kind of like a metaphor for like activism and libraries and organizations to me it's like a yeah same kind of thing like the real change comes from outside of the organizations i don't know if you've all saw the women of color and library statement about the co-option of black and a BIPOC work and anti-racism with no accountability and how the library industry uses anti-racism DEI as a tool for PR, but doesn't really stand behind these statements and doesn't really create change. I'm talking about people with power. We have a, a dean here. It's very a school director, right? He's got a lot of power. You can create some change. People need to create change, right? The, the kind of change that, I'll say it, Mr. Trump creates for his people. We need BIPOC leaders to create that kind of change for us, right? Oh, I don't wanna offend people, this and that. We need, we need to be treated like equally as human beings and we're not. And we need to say that out loud. Martine raised the point about free speech a little while ago. Librarians, it's they're defenders of free speech, right? And but you better not say something 
because you won't get a job. I've been kept out of the library, indus library industry. And I say industry because it's an industry because of my anti-racist work. I was doing anti-racist work before I knew what was it called anti-racist work. I thought I was doing DEI work. But anyway, libraries need to get on board with creating change. They need to be pushing change. One thing that's uh, that I think that libraries can do, I had some notes here, let me get my notes. We can talk about the social media problem. It's super disturbing to me to see libraries jumping wholeheartedly into social media without being in, uncritical about how it's destroying our democracy, about how it's creating uh, a platform for white supremacy. Social media is a white man's land. I say a white man's land because white man's land, it's not white women's land, white women help. And when I say that, I don't mean all white people, right? I hate explaining this, right? I'm talking about white racists and people that don't claim racism, you know? We grew up in the Americas. Everybody in America is, is racist because we grew up in a culture that's foundations are based on colorism and racism, right? Starting from the Spaniards. Um, so yeah, that's something that we could be doing is we could be talking about that. It's stunning to me, information literacy doesn't take on culture. Why should I believe? Here's another one. Where's the statement from ALA about critical race theory? Who's in leadership right now in ALA? Is it a white man? So, you know, DEI, anti-racism, et cetera, without accountability is, and I know I'm in ac uh, academia here, but it's bullshit. I'm sorry to say that. It's bullshit. We need to hold people accountable. I hold ALA totally accountable. They're not doing anything, very much. There's a lot of grants, there's a lot of trainings and stuff, but guess what? Racism isn't about ignorance. Are there ignorant racists? Yeah, but racism's about power. And people don't give up the power willingly. They don't go, oh, like, oh, I didn't know like, we were treating black people so bad. Like, oh, we're going to give up our power. Or, you know, think about this one. Men. Oh, uh, it's the patriarchy. That's wrong. Uh, we're going to give up our power willingly tomorrow. Is that going to happen? No, I ain't going to happen. We need to be rational and, and think about this stuff in rational terms. I had something else I wanted to say. Yeah. Topics like that, we need new people. I just gave a talk yesterday, Library Journal's class uh, on anti-racism, and it was ROI. Anti-racism is ROI. You know, academia is an incestuous gene pool. When I look at it, I go, man, the reason why there hasn't been any change is because there's a bunch of generations of college-educated people with the same backgrounds even people of color. A lot of times I meet people of color and I'm like, hey, what's up, man? How's it going? Oh, yeah, my dad was a professor and my dad was a librarian or whatever. My dad was a fucking heroin addict. Another thing I like to say is academia shouldn't isolate itself from people, right? From the people. Right now, academia's got a problem, a big problem with legitimacy. People don't believe in science and in facts. They don't believe in concepts anymore that, are, that, are, that have been proven because education has got so far away from people, right? Anyway, I, 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 that's, that's what I'd like to say is that we need to get more real and we need to talk about this stuff. People are suffering right now. There's people rotting away in jail cells. There's people at the border suffering all over the place. And we need to talk about it. I know I have limited time and I don't want to take up anybody else's time. I really respect uh, this. And I just wanted to say thank you again for being able for letting me speak. I, I think it's free speech is a huge deal. That's another issue in libraries. I'll say one last thing. Hate speech is not free speech. And we can't let people hide behind free speech when they're when they have symbols that symbolize the destruction of another culture, another people, et cetera. 
that's a big problem in libraries too. I sound like a bad librarian or something, or like no. I hate libraries. I love libraries, and that's why I'm saying what I'm talking. That's what I'm saying what I'm saying because I love libraries. And um, thank you. You're, you're welcome, and thank you, Max. You know the, the perspectives that, that you're sharing right now are so important for people to hear, and people don't like to hear things that are pesky. They don't like to hear uh, negativity, even when it's really happening. They don't want to hear it, and. I think there's a couple of things that you that I found really that I connected really strong with strongly with. And one of them is this unveiling that has to happen. Like people have to acknowledge uh, uh, the structures that are undermining uh, justice in library work and in information work. And so that unveiling has to happen. I think that that when you talked about like truth and and science and, and things like that, that this post-truth movement that we have in our field, we don't hear a lot about how it, it intersects really strongly with issues of racism and the structures in our field. But but I think that that dialogue needs to happen and that some of those post-truth uh, uh, issues in the social media are really like corruptive to our field and to the success of our new professionals, our existing professionals and our communities. So I appreciate you raising those issues. Did anyone else wanna have any chime in on this discussion? It's really challenging. Okay, so thank you, uh, Max. I really appreciate uh, your comments on, on these issues. We need to keep the, the dialogues going on these on on these challenges uh so our final question uh is to rosa i mean so you're a new professional and we're so inspired by our students that are doing fabulous things students like you and you see the the tensions with serving communities effectively uh the tensions between treating our colleagues well and with humanity uh, and you were sort of part of the planning of this and i want to make that uh known that you're part of planning this event which is uh, i think a really fantastic thing and so you have a unique perspective uh on leveraging latinx identities uh both as a student and as a new professional toward the development of rich programs and services for hispanic communities and so you helped us plan this event which is fabulous um, I'd like to invite you to share the infographic that you created sure. and to talk a little bit about that. I don't know if you can share your screen to do that. Uh, and I, I love this idea that you're going to exemplify libraries as leaders in the design of programs and services for Latinx, Chicanx, and uh, Hispanic communities. So I'm excited. I think everyone's going to love what you've created here. I went ahead and put that in the chat, so hopefully everyone got it. And I'd really just like to talk a little bit more about the best practices, if I may. Um, I have worked in a public library before uh, working in the academic library that I work in now. And one of the things that I had the privilege and um, really honor to do while working for the public library is manage a bookmobile. And I don't know if anyone has really fond memories, but I know that I have fond memories of bookmobiles and that, having that experience really taught me a really good lesson was that we went out and served the community in three different locations. And even though the locations were all Spanish speaking um, communities, all their needs were different. And the assumption was, you know, they're going to want bilingual books, they're going to want information about these things. But in reality, all those needs were different. So after um, spending some time with them and getting to know the community members by one, speaking in their language. So one of the things that I do really wanna point out and it's in, shared in the infographic is um, we need to make sure that we open our doors and make people feel welcome. Whether it's a public library, whether it's an academic library, that's one of my big things that I do with an outreach is how can I make the students where I work with will feel welcome. And um, when I was at the public library, that's that's one way that we do is engage with them, talk to them in their language. 
offer handouts that are um, both in Spanish and English. And don't assume that their needs, just because they, they look like they speak Spanish, that that's all they want. I encountered a gentleman that was from Oaxaca who was learning how to speak Spanish at the same time as um, he was trying to learn English. So it wasn't just learning English that he needed. So, you know, ask questions and really um, make yourself available to that because I think that's one of the key things that we need to do is have those conversations in order to better serve um, the community. And then we can start creating these programs that are um, that better serve those communities. And within that stop, I found that in one community, people, the adults really wanted to focus on um, materials that help them with raising their kids, how to talk to teenagers. Another community really wanted to focus on, you know, how to how to become citizens, how to speak English better, you know, what are some other resources in the community that offered these language classes. Another community had just a majority of teens. So having a teenage population there really helped me learn about, you know, a different um, age group where I was more used to working with adults. Um, so that's one of the things that I really wanted to uh, point out was the importance of um, really making them feel welcome. Um, another thing that I wanted to, to talk about was in academics. I know people have mentioned um, education in these past few comments. And for me, I'm a first generation, as you mentioned earlier, Latina, Mexican, um, and as a first generation coming back to academics, because I, I actually came back in 2008 to finish my college degree. And I didn't know how to navigate academia. So working in an academic space now, I realized that creating these partnerships within the community are very essential. So we need to really learn about our own communities and start to create those relationships with those people that are coming um, and organizing things for students. So our library has um, really uh, tried to engage with new students as well as transfer students to inform them about our library services at the resource fair. And one of the key things there was that not only did I get to talk to students, but also their parents. And coming from a Mexican background, you know, parents are very uh, cautious about where their kids are. They want to know that their kids are safe. So the parents were able to ask, like, what happens after 10 o'clock? Do you, do, are you really still open? And answering these type of questions to make them feel comfortable that their students are safe on campus was really essential for them. And then we can start providing these programs and services that um, we want for our students. Um, one of the things that are, sh are shared in the infographic is, you know, creating those, uh, those campus partnerships or community partnerships because it opens up to opening up relationships with people who already serve the Hispanic Latino community, right? So then you're also informing perhaps new uh, library patrons about the services that you have. And not only that, but it also, uh, it gets a conversation going about, you know, what kind of programs will better serve in that particular area. Um, so that's another thing that I wanted to talk about was, um, you know, the, the importance of building those campus and community partnerships and wherever your, your space is. Um, also, um, Rosa, do you mind if I, I share my screen to oh, show no, the infographic? Ahead. Okay, go sure. ahead and keep talking. I apologize for interrupting. Oh, no, no problem. I'm just going to take a little sip. Okay, let's see if I can share it. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, I think everyone wants to see the fabulous work you've done. I, have, I wasn't able, let's see if I can make it full screen. Let's so there, there are some key points, and I know some people have already mentioned these already about building collections. Um, some of the things that I mentioned there was assess your collection. Um, you know, what kind of budget do you have to spend? Review some of the subject headings and public catalogs. Are they accessible to the people that you're trying to actually inform them about the books you have in your collection? Um, ask users for their recommendations because they're the ones that are going to be checking these books out, these materials out, right? So we need to hear from them as well. 
and then also stay connected, um, you know, about new authors, new publishers, books, attend book fairs. Those are also very informative. Um, another key thing is having bilingual staff and retaining um, bilingual staff and also offering that pay differential for bilingual skills, because that's important. You know, we don't want to undermine what they're bringing to to their positions and to the community that they're that they're serving. Um, and encourage staff to join professional organizations that support Spanish speaking Latinx communities and also provide professional development funding um, for library uh, staff to attend. And as far as programs, um, creating programs that reflect the culture of the community. You know, we all live in different types of communities. We might have a larger population of people who are from, you know, Mexico City or Oaxaca or maybe even Guatemala or wherever and use them to see what kind of programs that they want. You know, um, we're on the campus that I work for. We have uh, a lowrider culture there. So we I collaborated with the uh, University Police Department and the Latino Center and the Latino Association of Faculty and Staff to create uh, or to help organize the lowrider experience where we had people all the way from Arizona come and attend. So really talk about what their needs are, what they would like to see, and also build your collections with that in mind. You know, if they're interested in these type of um, like lowriders, then purchase some books on lowriders and evaluate your programs to improve them. That's always essential. How can we better improve our programs to better serve those communities? And most of all, share your success. I can't say that enough. You know, if we don't share our success, then we can't ask for more funding to support some of these programs and initiatives that we want to implement in our in our libraries and in our communities. And another thing too that's important is, you know, what kind of barriers are set in place in the library that are preventing us from serving our users? And one of the things that we've encountered is you know, library cards, you know, we ask for different types of form of ID and maybe try to see how you can um, ask for a different type of identification, perhaps, you know, ask for something that's been mailed to their home instead of a physical ID or a passport or something else that they might have on hand versus what you typically ask for a library card. You know, what kind of barriers are we putting? And also review your policies, you know, what kind of policies maybe they need to be revised to make sure that they're meeting the community needs and you're not creating some of those barriers. Yeah, so that's all I have. And if anybody else wants to add um, anything, I uh, that would be great. This is fabulous, Rosa. We have one question in the Q&A about uh, Adriana Pu, who I think is one of my former students. Hi, Adriana. I uh, guess building community is so important. Share your story and ask questions that shows uh, uh, you're interested in, in them. A uh, question, have you ever experienced imposter syndrome and how have you overcome those feelings? Absolutely. You know, um, I know we were limited on time, but that's something that I, I have experienced since the very beginning. You know, when you're trying to learn how to navigate academia, you walk into a building and you don't see someone that reflects you. So you feel a little bit uncomfortable. You know, you're like, is it okay to ask or should, shouldn't I know this? I'm an adult. You know, I should already have this knowledge. But in reality, we don't. It actually took a professor when I was at a community college to tell me and say, hey, go to the library. They have so many resources for you because I didn't know what kind of um, the differences in the citations that I was needing to use for her class. And she opened my mind. I'm like, what? The library is going to show me how to, you know, how to cite my sources correctly. And she's like, oh, yeah, they have tutors. They have this, you know, all these resources. So, you know, having that imposter syndrome, not feeling like you don't belong, it's always in the back of my mind. And Someone once told me, you know, no matter how many initials I have behind my name, I still feel that being Mexican, no matter how many initials I have, I still can't get over that. And so I totally agree with, with that. It's, you know, as, as educated as we are, I think it's just the culture that we, um, 
that I, at least I have, I speak for myself is that, you know, we are taught respect this, you know, you know, when we have undocumented families, don't ask too many questions, you know, and as we start to get older, we still, we still feel those, we still feel those um, experiences and it's hard to overcome those. Thank you, Rosan. Uh, does anyone else want to chime in on her fab fabulous presentation of that infographic, which I love? And it covers so much, uh, so much important information. So thank you. Well, I hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end for more questions for everybody. Uh, but for now, I'm going to try to move to the our next panel. Actually, uh, so I want to thank everybody on this panel for the information that they shared and the good perspectives, uh, which are rich and so helpful to everybody. So our second panel is really about expanding uh, the discussion on best practices. And I think that the graphic is a great segue as everybody is commenting in the chat about how wonderful the graphic is. And it's a great segue into this discussion about best practices. And so our second panel uh, the members are uh, Catherine uh, Blackmer Reyes, and I'm just, I'm going, I apologize for paper shuffling, but I have these wonderful biographies that I want to share. Uh, and she's the director of, uh, and librarian of Africana, Asian American Chicano, uh, doc, so Dr. Catherine Blackmer Reyes, I apologize for uh, fluffy enough, uh, and Native American Studies Center at SGSU King Library. And uh, she joined SGSU in 2007. So she holds a BA in Chicano Studies and Sociology from UC Davis and has completed graduate work toward the PhD in Sociology at SUNY Binghamton. Uh, she's an SGSU alumna where she received her MLIS. Uh, she's been a personal inspiration to me because I share her work with my students almost every day of the semester. Look at what these beautiful uh, research guides that have been created at the King Library. So I've always been excited about your work. Now I'm just happy to connect with you more. Uh, so as director of the AAA CNA, she oversees the growth development and programming of this, the collaborative space and its collections. So she's done some awesome stuff. I'm excited to see what she shares today. Uh, another member of our panel, we have three students, uh, Linda Dummy, uh, who's from San Diego, more San Diego peeps. I, I'm a San Diego peep, so I, I love to see my San Diego uh, connections. Uh, and she has some experience running a student bookstore. She owned a business for seven years and currently works as a library clerk at the San Diego Public Library. Library, I grew up in the, I was a library kid in the county libraries in San Diego. So love these systems there. Uh, she graduated from University of California, San Diego with a bachelor's in anthropology and is currently an MLS student at SDSU. And uh, she's really committed to issues of equity and inclusion. And she's been doing some great work in my class. And she's going to share some big suggestions and some other uh, information. Uh, so thank you. Uh, Jillian Mariano is another student enrolled in Info 275. And she works as a Filipino community organizer and aspiring public librarian, hoping to serve, build, and connect communities in her day-to-day -day life. And Jillian is interested in sharing information about how the Hispanic and Filipino communities have worked together in solidarity, like during the 1965 Dolano uh, grape strikes. And so that's uh, some interesting perspectives that will come from uh, Jillian. And finally, we have Monica Roman, uh, and she's from Southern California. She received her BA in history from Southern New Hampshire University back in 2020. Uh, so she is following a mixture of youth services and public librarianship, MLS career pathways at San Jose, and she's hoping to graduate this spring. Uh, she has about eight years of experience working in libraries, and uh, she'd like to become a children's librarian in a public library. So she also has some resources that she's going to share. Uh, I'm excited to hear her examples of innovative programs and resources. So I'm just going to uh, set the introductions there, extend a warm welcome to Catherine, who is our first uh, panelist. Uh, so Catherine, do you want to jump in and share uh, what you came to sh share with us today. Sure. Thank you, Kristen. And thank you, um, all the previous speakers. Um, 
I've uh, known Martin, I think since when I started library school, he's one of the first um, uh, Latino librarians that I, I, I remember hearing uh, about um, and, and certainly have also worked with Jose through Reforma. But I mean, my, my mentors as librarians, and I was very fortunate in that I had a very strong Chicana, Chicano um, mentors as in faculty, and then also as librarians, which is, uh, I think, interesting in that um, at Davis, I had um, uh, Helen Moreno, and I think it's her name, I can't remember, um, but she she was great. I didn't use her because I felt like I could manage the library as a student, um, I, you know, navigating those sort of uh, uh, challenges as an undergraduate and thinking that you understood um, in part what's happening in that sort of description of the imposter syndrome, which I don't really um, like to use, but I do or, or associate with, but I think, you know, we, we all have to go into new environments and we all are challenged to deal with new environments and we should never feel that we don't belong and, and we have to own it and we have to learn. So, you know, going to a university as UC Davis, um, having grown up, uh, been uh, born and raised in San Francisco, uh, of nine months of the year and then three months of the year, I was in Mexico City um, where I was with my cousins and my grandparents and extended family. I mean, I had, I had great free, more freedom in Mexico City. Why? I don't know than I did in San Francisco. But, but it was, you know, Davis to me was a culture shock. Davis to me was I, I couldn't relate. I couldn't uh, I couldn't relate to my classmates who thought you know fifty dollars was nothing to pay for city college, um, and not understanding the economic um, uh, I guess difficulties for anybody who who had fifty dollars that could buy shoes, pay a bill, um, you know that you know. Uh, uh, College education, even at City College, $50 is too much. But those were conversations I was having with my, my classmates in the dorms. Um, and and it, was, it was very hard. And like Jose, I got into academic probation and, you know, and I struggled. And, and, but, you know, you persevere. You know. Fortunately, I never wanted to work. Uh, out, you know, I never wanted to live in my parents' home. So for those desires, I got myself back into, into Davis and, and I was able to, to complete my, my, uh, my education. Uh, and, and frankly, it was libraries that really helped me understand that I could be a student. And it was a, fact, a, a course that I took with Vicki Ruiz in Mexican American history, where she made us go to the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley. And all of a sudden it just like wonders opened to me, and uh, and I felt like, okay, this is my end. Library is my end. I can do research. I can I can I can analyze the materials, and I can do the paper. I still might not write all that great, but I can do it. I can think, and I think that was really something that um, that uh, was really important as as an undergraduate student. Um, but as I said, I had. Um, uh, Librarians, Chicano, Latin, uh, Chicana and Chicano librarians, Richard Chabran, founder of the UCLA Chicano Research Center, founder of the UC Berkeley Ethnic Studies uh, or Chicano Studies Library, and then later Lillian Castillo Speed, um, and then Rafaela Castro, who would later join UC Davis. Um, and, and so I, I not only had the librarians, but I had the professors. I had, I, I, as an undergraduate, I had a majority Chicana faculty. In, and that is also an unbelievable statistic. And many, many of my class, many of my friends that I've known who did Chicano studies outside uh, in other universities often would tell me that they only had one female as an instructor. So, so I had very positive images um, and very strong images. Um, and, and I learned how to navigate academia as an undergraduate and I paid attention. I think that's, that's the thing is that you have to pay attention. You just can't, you know, just kind of go with it. And so, um, so that, that to me was really, really important as an undergrad. Um, but I think, you know, as a, and then as a graduate student, I found myself in Binghamton and 
where it's sort of this public um, Ivy League school and a lot of the inner city kids from New York City were atten or attending Binghamton. I was on a fellowship. I wasn't having to, I wasn't required to, to TA or teach. And many of my classmates in the department were international students that had no idea about the US race ethnic literature, nothing. And so um, they would send me their students. And so I would have a conversation with them as to what to their paper, their topic, what they wanted to do. You know, I try to say, let's just get the assignment done. And then I would take them down to the library and I would show them how to find the resources. So I really loved that conversation. I loved that ability to work with students. I loved what I was, what I was teaching and how I was engaging with the students. And so um, I got back to San Francisco and that's when I decided to apply to library school. And, and so I've been very fortunate in my academic appointments, having been at UC Santa Cruz, at Sac State, and now at San Jose State. And I think here at San Jose State, I've had the, the fortune to, to oversee the race ethnic collection. So it's a long name, Africana, Asian American, Chicano, and Native American Studies uh, Center. It's a, it's a center that originated with the, um, the inauguration of the Chicano Studies Research Center at San Jose. Um, San Jose State uh, was the first uh, CSU to have a Mexican American Studies graduate program. Um, and so the students wanted a library. They got the library after, after many years of struggle. These things are never created just because people want to give it to you. They, they're created because of struggle. Um, and certainly the space that I oversee was created through struggle. Uh, and thank goodness we had faculty and community members that um, advocated for the space that I now oversee. Um, and my predecessor, Jeff Paul, who was, who was also very active in, in Reforma and in the community, he, he also, uh, he was key in the, in the foundation of the work that I, I've been doing. So, so what have I been doing as a librarian, I suppose, in, in um, here at San Jose State, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start sharing my my screen um, because I have lots of projects and lots of things that I've been doing, and that I don't think I've I um, I think what's been so wonderful about being an academic librarian is that I've been able to um, I've been able to do a lot of my interests. What sort of makes me um, excited, what, how I, what I breathe. Um, and so um, there's a lot of creativity uh, involved. Um, I've, I've, um, I've been able to um, place my, my foundation as an academic into my work it, uh, it, more so than I think, um, I don't know where I'm just, it, it just, it's better than being an academic and uh, as a, as a teaching faculty, I think, because I get the best of both worlds. I get to work with students. I get to do work with uh, an area of work that I'm really excited about, that I'm knowledgeable. And then, you know, I get to build collections. I mean, how, how, you know, what, uh, what can be an, more exciting than that? So, um, and of course, as uh, Kristen uh, mentioned, um, I do, of course, use the finding aids. And so these are the, the lib guides that I've, one of the many uh, uh, lib guides that I've, I've created. Um, and, and so there are others, but these are sort of to help the materials, but that's the basic. Um, I think in this question of community, uh, um, I have been um, really, um, um, I've been trying to develop a digital collections because my space is not an archive, even though it's considered special collections that I have no archive space. And so I've been trying to uh, develop these digital collections, these community collections, because it is interesting that San Jose actually for its history in California, uh, its history and its involvement in the Chicano movement um, is not well documented. You can talk about San Francisco, you can talk about LA, but San, San Jose is completely off of the map, even though San, San Jose had the largest um, uh, participation membership of the American GI Forum uh, uh, outside of Texas. So, so you had a bunch of you know, uh, Chicano veterans 
in San Jose who were organizing parades for the 16 de septiembre, Cinco de Mayo, and they were huge. There were huge parades. And, and everybody would come to San Jose. And, and it was like, they would just be completely taking over the city of, uh, of San Jose. And so there are things that for whatever reason, it just hasn't been documented. And so my goal in, has been to document um, San Jose, Chicano San Jose history. And so part of what I've done here is these materials, some of them are not San Jose, but they are uh, related to San Jose. And so I've, I've been trying to cr create these digital uh, collections. And so Gonzalez uh, was one of the, the David Sierra. He was one of the GI Forum members. He was the editor of the local uh, uh, GI Forum newsletter. He was the editor of the national GI Forum uh, newsletter. And so, um, so it's, it's, a, it's his columns, everything he's written. Uh, and so those are items that is sort of a one of a kind. Um, I have, I've even placed up flyers of what I've done in the center. Um, and Jose Villa was a professor here at, at San Jose State. Um, he, um, he was uh, long before, you know, Facebook and Twitter and everything, he, he was the chair of of, of, of a committee that was looking into one of the police brutalities uh, in San Jose of the Chicano here in San Jose. And it's amazing in the documentation that he of how they communicated and networked long before, you know, you know, Black Lives Matter, but it's all related. I mean, it's, it, it's an amazing uh, work of what, what they've done. And so there's other work that, that I've been doing and trying to document the, the work. Um, Currently, I have this project called Before Silicon Valley. And so I'm working with um, a, a, a professor, uh, Margot McBain, and an oral history uh, scholar, Suzanne Guerra. And we're, uh, they, those two have this rich history of oral histories of cannery workers in, in the Santa Clara Valley. And also the, the, the night, uh, nightclubs, the music. So they've, been, they've interviewed the, the bands, the musicians and all that. So I, I've, I've seen their work, I've known their work for a long, long time. And so we were able to uh, get a $200,000 grant from uh, Santa Clara, um, Santa Clara Historical Grant. And so we're, we're, we're doing more uh, interviews, we're developing the Gilroy um, uh, certain worker canneries interviews and so we're scanning new materials and so this is a project that I've, I've uh, been doing uh, currently uh, with Margot and Suzanne. One of the items that I've been doing here uh, in part in, in because we did the shelter in place and then on top of the, the Black Lives Matters movement was the Spartan Quest um, and and we we looked at the um, the monuments um, that San Jose, the university has. And so the, the, the monuments we have in the university were, are all uh, student funded, um, not university administration. And, and in many cases, even, even the, the athletics, you know, the Smith and Carlos statues, Smith and Carlos were not fondly uh, appreciated by the administration. And so, so until, you know, many years later, the administration discovered that, oh, it could be a fundraising effort. And so they've now um, uh, embraced Smith and Carlos. And so we, in this effort, um, with some with colleagues from, uh, from here from the library, and then my advisory board from the center, we, um, we looked at monuments and also local monuments um, that speak to the community. And so um, that's uh, something you may be, I have the links, I'll, 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 uh, glue, I'll paste the links to these pages that I'm referring to so that if you'd like to, to go on your own. Um, other activities, I've hosted the Latino Comics Expo here at San Jose State, um, and, 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 and it was the first time that the that the, the Latino Comics Expo was done at a university. Usually they're done, they're, they've been hosted at San Francisco in the, in the Comics Museum. Um, I got involved in looking at comics because you were starting to see Kickstarters of, from minority 
uh, individuals, right? So it wasn't the Marvel, it wasn't the it wasn't the sort of you know high profile comics of Superman and Batman and all that, but I we're starting to see uh, Chicano Latino characters, and and they were the artists were doing Kickstarter projects, and so I I really thought there was some there was something very important. I also got to uh, I've known of Frederick Aldama, who is like the Latinx comics professor uh, in 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 the states, right and. And so there, I was mixing in the popular culture with the academic. And so that was something that, again, that I've, I've been trying to do in my, my own activities. Um, so the other, uh, last year, two years ago, I guess, two years ago, I collaborated with the public library because this is a joint library um, with the public and the university. And um, really it was the public library, the California room, Estela Inda, who, who made the effort to, um, to do this exhibit. Um, the, the founder of Lowrider Magazine was a student here at San Jose State. You know, this is sort of information that, and the, uh, that you know, that is not shared in, in Lowrider. Again, it's San Francisco, LA. Um, but San Jose and the conversation, San, San Jose was key to, to having, you know, made the magazine. It was founded here. Uh, there were very unique styles of, of the cars and, and the electronics, the hydraulics, the, the found the, to discover the maker of the hydraulics was, is from San Jose. And so there's, there's such an impact of, the, of what has not been documented. And so that, again, is part of the, the things that I've, I've, I've been doing. So uh, currently what I, I'm sort of trying to do now is I'm looking at the Day of the Dead. It's that season. Uh, we do a very elaborate exhibit up on the on the floor. We I transform the the academic space into really a, a whole sort of gallery of things. I don't I don't have sort of cater. I, I'm not a museum person, but you know I've learned, uh, and so so there's quite a bit that um, that you know that I've I've been able to do and changing. The, the library into into this really welcoming welcoming space and so it, it's something that we did as part of the the in the pandemic we we created um, uh, an online virtual uh, reality uh, exhibit of the altars um, and and so this is uh, our first attempt we 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 um, and so if you I just want to get around here we created this this world and and i don't know if you're uh you might oops, I'll get here um we created this but this sort of uh um, space for the altars um and and it's actually comes from the the old uh via the mexican the mexico city via and so it's the the, the, the colleague that created the space for us took uh, a part of the of the structure the old the old structure and created this um, the sort of alleyway of, of the, of the um, for the um, altars and we took pictures we created the 3d images um, and so this is that that product so um, so there's a lot that I've done as an academic as an academic uh, librarian, um, I do want to mention that part of my own academic uh, involvement, although I am part of Reforma, BPLG, Bibliotecas para la Gente, was, you know, uh, one of the, I, I still remember my first meeting in that, but I, I've always been part of the National Association for Chicana and Chicano Studies, uh, and so that's been very key. The other organization that I'm, I'm now as a, as a, um, a scholar, um, I forget what they, they, they call it, the um, uh, uh, Scholars Council is the Mexican American Civil Rights Institute. And so, um, so I'm the only librarian in this, this great uh, council of scholars. And so that's really, really exciting to, to be part of that. And, and I'm, I'm fortunate to really know all of these individuals. And so it's, it's um, being a part of the Chicana, Chicano Studies circle has been key in the work that I've been doing and what I continue to do. So I think that is enough for now. So thank you. 
This is fabulous, Catherine. Uh, Michelle, I'm going to transition the, the next components to you. Okay, so um, next up we have, um, and the order might have changed a little bit, but I know we're all here. So uh, thank you, Catherine. That was amazing. I'm going to reach out to you because I have lots of ideas and questions. So I'll be in touch. Um, uh, but our next uh, individual, uh, Linda, Linda Dammy, uh, will be speaking about uh, book suggestions as well as points to think about related to developing Spanish speaking collections. So beyond books, thinking about art, hol art um, holidays, uh, LGBTQIA plus representation and other aspects. So Linda, I'll turn it over to you. Hey everyone. Um, my name is Linda. I live in San Diego, California, and I currently work as a clerk for San Diego Public Library. I'm part of the EDI committee at the library, um, trying to make policy changes um, and programming and provide trainings for employees to make things more equitable for a staff and patrons and the public that we deal with every day. So here's my presentation. Some of it's a repeat of a little bit of the stuff Max said, a little bit of stuff Rosa said. I'm sorry if it seems very like elementary, but I, I wasn't sure what, like the experience level of the people that are here and what sort of programming they've done and if they've worked with like how much sort of theory they've gotten into. So here's my presentation. Can you guys see the screen? Yes, yes, it looks great. Okay. You can share all panels. Okay. So let me make this bigger. Okay, I hope this is working. So I just want to talk about doing a collection assessment. I want to encourage everyone to um, use non-traditional ways to assess your collection. Um, I talked to some of our um, support staff when I was making this presentation. I talked to security and um, some of the, our janitorial staff who happened to be Mexican. Um, just ask them what, how, what they felt our collection was lacking and if they use the public library, if they read books in Spanish, what would they would like to see in our collection. And um, they told me that they noticed there was a lack of diversity in adult Spanish books. So there's tons of books for um, children of all ages. Um, but once you got to the adult um, Spanish sections, it, it kind of narrowed out in topics. A lot of it is religious um, or health related books. And there are some novels, of course, and there is some nonfiction, but it's not a diversity of topics. So if somebody is a native Spanish speaker and is looking for maybe mental health um, resources or things like that, they can't find what they're looking for. Um, one suggestion by listening to the panel that I thought about suggesting to our EDI committee is um, putting our book request form that's on our website in other languages, not just English, so that people who are not native speakers can request books. Um, also, um, don't assume that you know what the Spanish speakers in your area want or need. Um, it's going to change depending on uh, what country they're from. If you're from Spain, you speak a different form of Spanish than someone from Mexico or from other Latin American countries. Um, and then their proximity to the border, the demographics of the area, whether they're refugees, uh, whether there's an immersion school. So I happen to work at a branch that, near, that is near an immersion school. So the kids are actually learning 90% um, of the day in Spanish and probably they had take English classes. So even though they might not be of Hispanic heritage, they are needing a diverse um, set of books, probably more than most other libraries. Um, um, Spanish speakers are not a monolith, so make sure to include um, resources and books that are from uh, varying perspectives and countries, not just the countries closest to you. So uh, we happen to be near Mexico. There is a lot of uh, programming for Mexican people um, 
in books, but there's also people from Cuba, from Haiti, from Spain, um, all over Latin America, and they have their own unique perspectives. They have their own unique cultures, and that should all be recognized. And then also I happen to work with a books, I mean, I have to live with a bookseller and um, booksellers and bookstores can be great resources if you're struggling to find new titles for your collections. Um, talk to some of the booksellers in your area. Um, they will, they tend to have a, like a better pulse on the newest titles and the new authors and local authors in your area. Okay, so our library made this great resource. They had an idea, um, resources for new San Diegans because we tend to get a lot of refugees in San Diego. And this does have a lot of really good information, but it's all in Spanish. I mean, it's all in English. It would be nice if we offered it in other languages for the populations that we're trying to um, help. Sorry guys, I'm really nervous. Um, Okay, so I also think it's important to provide books in English and in Spanish that provide, uh, that show characters or show people in the books that are not just white <laughs> and are um, diverse and have different backgrounds. Um, I learned some stuff while making this presentation. I did not know about the Lemon Grove incident that happened in Lemon Grove, San Diego in the 1930s. It was an attempt to uh, segregate schools so that Mexican students had a separate school than the white students in the area when before it was not segregated. And the students and their parents decided to boycott the Lemon Grove School District. And um, through the help of the Mexican consulate um, and a legal case successfully, um, I don't know what the word is. They were successful in proving that it was not fair to segregate Mexican students from white students and that they were not gonna get the same sort of education that they would if the schools were segregated. So they basically stopped desegregation in California and I think probably the rest of the US for Mexican students. Um, and also it's important to have role models for students that are shown um, that these two books are um, a Mexican-American astronaut. And he wrote the books himself. So they're in his own words. And there's two different versions of the book. It's almost the same title. One's the boy who touched the stars. One's the boy who saw the stars, I think. Um, but I thought that was nice. And it's interesting that it's the same title, but two different books. They're different stories when I looked inside. I don't know how to go back. Um, this is Zochi and the Flowers. It talks about a girl who's from, I forget where she's from, but it's not Mexico. It's from where, somewhere in Latin America and her parents uh, immigrated to the US are trying to, they're struggling to make a living in the US. So this is something that children who live in border areas have uh, probably um, deal with and can connect to. Um, this book's really cool. The author is from Mexico City and the book incorporates traditional Aztec and Mayan style art. So the little like swirls that are coming out of the conch shell, that's a speech scroll that's used in uh, Latin American art. Um, the book, We Are the Water Protectors, I didn't want to um, leave out Native American um, resources. That's written and illustrated by Native Americans. And then um, the Aztec account of the conquest of New Mexico is written by someone who's Mexican. Um, I also featured a few local authors. Um, Matt de la Pena is half Mexican, and this book seems semi-autographical. Uh, autobiographical. And Victor Villasenor, it's a magical realism. Um, and I also wanted to encourage everyone to use, to 
include LGBTQ representation, not just during LGBTQ month. I know everybody knows about Frida Kahlo, uh, but there are other important Latin American LGBTQ icons. And then going beyond books, um, take time to learn about the cultures that you're trying to meet their needs. It kind of made this, it can be applied to any culture. So I'm not, um, I'm not Latinx. I'm actually Middle Eastern, but there's not, there's not many books like showing my experience. So um, go beyond novelists in the ALA to include things like art, movies, um, cooking classes if you can. We started, I started a virtual cooking series while we were closed down during the pandemic called Cooking Around the World and different staff members uh, shared recipes from their homes that they grew up with as a way to connect with patrons uh, even while we were closed. So um, you could also partner with local organizations. Um, in San Diego, we're lucky there are there are Kumeyaay classes and Nahuatl classes that you can take um, if you want to connect to your heritage that way. Um, and then there are also festival and holidays. Uh, everybody knows about Dia de los Muertos, but we also celebrate uh, Dia de los Niños at our, at our work. There's also Mexican um, Mother's Day. And then Mexican Independence Day is actually an important holiday, not Cinco de Mayo, which is gets celebrated a lot. Um, and also, if you have performance space, spaces or you can partner with um, local theaters uh, or danza or folklorical uh, performances, it's a great way for patrons to learn more about different cultures or to connect with their own. So here's some cookbooks that we have in our ebook. We have it in person too. Um, a book on danza and some pictures of Azteca dancing and folklorical. And then some DVDs, nonfiction and fiction. Don't forget to include Latin American music in your collections and movies. And then don't forget about e-services. I haven't heard anybody really mentioning e-services, but one thing that's nice about them is that you can choose the language that your uh, computer or phone or whatever is showing you. So it's it's a little bit more of an accessible way for people to navigate and find resources that they have in their local collections. So we have something called Canopy at the library. That's for documentaries and TV shows. And then we also have, uh, we use Cloud Library for eBooks and audiobooks. Um, and that's a really good training um, from info people if anybody's interested in learning on how to be more inclusive in their reader's advisory. Okay, thank you. Linda, that was fabulous. And you did a wonderful job. You had a lot of support. We're all here to support you. So I really appreciate you sharing and all the fabulous things that are being done in, in San Diego. And I know you guys collaborate like with San Diego, um, the law library and other organizations. So I think the main thing I got from yours was knowing your community. It goes back to who are the communities that are in your neighborhoods around you that might be migrating in and how they might be changing. So really understanding their needs and then pivoting and ensuring, you know, diversity of languages, diversity of resources, different modes. Uh, and you guys are doing a fabulous job. So thank you for sharing. I think I know that uh, we have two more student presenters. So I'm going to pass it on to the next one, do a quick intro. And then I know there's a few questions and hopefully we can get to those at the end. But now I'm gonna to transition to Jillian, Jillian uh, Mariano, who will be sharing about uh, how the Hispanic and Filipino communities have worked together in solidarity. Jillian. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me on. Now all of a sudden I'm <laughs> super duper nervous. Um, but yeah, I guess I'll just uh, start at the beginning. So um, I grew up in the Central Valley in a predominantly Hispanic and Latino community. Um, my family was one of the only Filipino families um, in the area. And, you know, we all kind of like knew each other. We were like practically blood related. Um, so basically before the Walmart was built in my hometown, it was um, of course a mostly farm working community. Um, 
which is another issue. Um, of course, the community is still very heavily like agricultural, ringed with like orchards and fields, but definitely the suburban creep is happening. Um, and, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but growing up, a lot of my classmates' parents worked in the fields. And it was one of those places where people sort of sold like flowers and fruit and jam on the side of the road. Um, and so my grandfather, um, before he was sponsored to come here to the United States, was um, a lawyer for farmers in the Philippines. And then he came over here to the United States and became a, a farm worker himself and was like a lead um, on the fields, you know, right by um, other Filipinos and other um, Mexican folks um, in the fields. Anyways, um, all that is to say is that I had no idea, even though it was all around me, all of the clues um, about the, um, the solidarity between Latinos and Filipinos um, during the 1965 Delano grape strike. Um, of course, I knew about like Cesar Chavez and all of that um, during you know elementary school, but it wasn't really like mine. Um, and I didn't know about Larry Itliong and Philip Veracruz and other Filipino farm worker leaders until I went to UC Davis um, and studied Asian American studies. And my friend from the local Filipino social club was like, oh, yeah, I have this internship um, opportunity. Um, have you heard of like Cesar Chavez? And I was like, yes, of course, I've heard of Cesar Chavez. Um, but have you heard of like Larry Itliong? I had no idea what she was talking about. Um, so I did the internship because I really wanted to know and uncover sort of this um, secret-ish uh, side of like my history. Um, the internship itself was a little wild. Apparently it was um, created by this local woman who sort of only did it because she didn't pay some of like her uh, water bills and the the town was going to um anyways she was amazing um my friend was amazing and I learned a lot about um how the community sort of like came together and worked together to make all of these incredible uh, changes and really gained dignity and respect for the farm worker community who are like so important to California and also to just life itself because we can't live without food. Um, and so that really inspired me to go on to next summer and get involved with um, what is now known as Project Ulosan. Um, I met my mentor at UC Davis, um, Professor Robin Rodriguez, um, who introduced me to like the League of Filipino Students, which I joined later on um, when I graduated from college. Um, but anyways, so I worked with her on Project Ulosan. I didn't really do sort of the archival work, but I was like on the field, getting hotel rooms and like chasing down old farm workers to have her interview them and be like, oh, who are you again? I'm Jillian. Um, but so, yeah. And <laughs> anyways, that's all kind of what led me here to um, the, uh, the iSchool and what has started me on my path towards um, public librarianship. And oh my gosh, my uh program was not as cool as everybody else's but um thank you that's all Jillian I think it was cool as everyone else's that was great you're sharing and I think the importance of I would say all of the identities we each have so many identities and the intersectionality between them and how we can I would say rise up how we can support each other connect in solidarity and be stronger together. Uh, and then that leads to, you know, even having stronger leadership, being um, better advocates and even being better at advocacy. So I really appreciate you sharing the story and 
and uh, your experiences. Thank you. So let's transition to our uh, next uh, student panelist. Monica Roman is going to speak with us about her library's passive program uh, called Dial a Story, Telecuento, where children can hear a free and fun story in Spanish and English. And I will turn it over to Monica. Hi, um, I hope everyone can hear me. I can, I have like my earphones in so it sounds muffled. Uh, but basically my library received this program through the California Library Association, uh, a bunch of our staff entered into a raffle. So that's how we received this. Um, I should mention, I work at the Whittier Public Library uh, in California. Whittier is a very, very predominantly Hispanic community. I had to do a scan of our community recently for uh, Kristen's class, actually. And I found out our Hispanic community is way huger or like way larger than I thought. Um, so according to the Data USA, we're at 67.3% Hispanic community. So it's quite large. Um, so what the program is, it's basically what it sounds like. It's dial a story. There's a phone number available um, and I'll share my screen. I just have notes up, so I don't want you guys to see my notes. So it looks like I'm prepared. Um, but I'll share that at the end because it has a phone number. So basically you'll be prompted to either press one for English or two for Spanish. Um, and the introduction record is actually by our library manager. Her name is Yvonne Ariola. She's actually a Reforma LA member. Um, so she does like the intro and then our children's librarian, Robin, uh, will say like, hi, my name's Robin. Go ahead and like take a seat and get comfy because the story is about to start. And um, it's really, really cool. The stories change weekly too. So this week it's actually uh, Rumpled Stiltskin by the Brothers Grimm and the narration is pretty fantastic. Uh, the narrator changes her voice very creepily when she's reading Rumpled Stiltskin and she sings like the little creepy song that he sings. And I had it on speaker and it kind of freaked out uh, my husband. He's like, what are you listening to? It's like, it's for school, don't worry. Um, so it's, it's very, very fun story. It kind of reminds me, not that I was like alive when this happened, but my grandparents are very, very big on like um, radio stories. So I think this is kind of like throwing it back to that day when you would just like tune into the radio um, and then you would listen to a story like the whole war of the world and people thought like the world was dying when it wasn't it was just like a story so it's kind of throwback to that um, and uh, the story changes weekly too so you can call any day anytime from any phone and the story changes weekly um, altogether the phone call lasted around eight minutes uh, after like prompting English or Spanish um, and like Kristen had mentioned earlier, COVID has been a considerable challenge for public libraries all across the board. And a lot of story times had to transition from in-person to like YouTube or Facebook Live or Instagram Live. But um, like Rosa's graphic pointed out, uh, some Hispanic communities face like technology barriers. They don't have access to the internet. They don't have computers, but more than likely they have a phone um, and it's a free number. It's not charging you by the minutes or anything. So if your kid is like, especially children, they love to hear the same story over and over again. So you could just easily hit redial and then press the same buttons and just play the story over. Um, so yeah, that's uh, the program that I wanted to share. Um, and then I'll share my screen so you can see the phone number itself because now I'm done speaking. So you won't have to see my notes. Yay. Um, so that's it. That's our little like infographic for the program. And um, the phone number is bolded here. Um, and then, like I said, you can call any day, anytime, any phone. It doesn't have to be like a landline. It could be a cell phone. Um, and I just think it's a really great program uh, and that it's, it's a very nice way, especially for patrons who are still sort of wary. We do have outdoor story time, but I know people are still a little cautious about coming back to the library, um, which is understandable. So this is a great way for them to still get story time um, if they can't make it to the library or if they don't have the means to watch it online because they don't have internet. Yeah, so that's uh, my presentation. I talked really fast because I was nervous, but that's all I really have to say. Monica, that was great. And um... 
I put it in the chat. So if anybody wants to call the phone number and listen to one of the stories, I'm going to call. I think that's really cool. <laughs> I wanted to ask one question real quick. Like, how are the stories determined? Like who chooses um, them or is there like a list you have or? I'm not sure. I was trying to get more information from our library manager. It sounds like CLA um, is the person that is giving us the actual narration of the stories. It's just library staff that's doing like the introduction um, and then letting them to know, uh, like, please call back next week for a new story. But it sounds like the stories and the narrations themselves are provided through CLA. Got it. Um, okay, for those that you. don't know, CLA is the California Library Association. I might not have said that, so yeah. Thank you, Monica. Yeah. Um, I know we're at the top of the hour. Um, Kristen, do we have a few minutes to entertain some questions that came in? I do. I, I have time to stay. I, I think that we <laughs> I, I know we lost we have, some people. We but, lost uh, a few people along the way, but we still have 94 people and there are some questions in the Q&A and, a, and I, I'm okay to push it ahead. I do want to thank the panelists that had to leave early because they have other meetings. I know Martin had somewhere where he needed to go uh, and Jose has to leave soon. So if anyone has a question for Jose, maybe we should do that before he has to leave. I just want to thank you again, Jose, and remind everyone about ACRL's election of which he is a candidate. And so we don't talk about endorsements or anything like that. We just mention it's happening. It's it's an election. He's a candidate for 2020, 2022 uh, president-elect president. So this is exciting time for Jose. So, and I'm not sure I see a question for Jose right now, but I don't know if you want to take the mic real briefly, Jose, and say, I know you have to leave here in, in a second. Well, yes, um, I just want to thank everyone. This has been a true dynamic webinar. And I thank Max for inspiring us to be that change. And uh, he's provided enough arsenal in my mind right now that I'll be in touch with you, Max, in the near future to uh, talk about other things. Um, I want to thank all of you. This has been fantastic. Thank you for the opportunity to share my story, but also to listen to your stories um, all of you are doing wonderful things and enjoy your weekend. Take care. Thank you, Jose. Thank you. Should we take, uh, I know there's three questions I see. Should we take the one in the chat? There's been a little dialogue around. The one about uh, statistics. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think hasn't Arizona too bad uh, uh, Jose has to leave, but I thought Arizona State had uh, been a leader with uh, developing some of these strategies for uh, understanding relationships between population sizes and uh, collection building, but I bet there's others here that know more than I and do. Let me, let me read the question too for those, and it'll be on the recording. Does anyone have a formula they use to determine the size of their Spanish language collections? Do you generally look at the percentage of the community that's Spanish speaking based on census or other data uh, and try to mirror that percentage? Or um, do you determine, how do you determine these sizes? Um, so I know there were a few responses. I'm scrolling through the chat. I know in a lot, a lot of libraries, it's completely ad hoc. Yeah, or you know, maybe based on a needs assessment and what they determine mm -hmm. um, based on their community and how large their communities are. I am aware of some work uh, done by Drexel and by the Arizona State Library in this area. I, I need to read up on it again. I don't think that they came up with an actual formula though. It was more about the steps that you should take to uh, determine uh, what and how much growth you need. Yeah, and it'll probably depend too, um, and I think I saw this in the chat about budget. So of course mm -hmm. budget and the size of your buildings, um, not just community demographics. So if you don't have the space or maybe transitioning to the electronic and knowing you might be able to get more mm -hmm. in electronic databases or eBooks versus in physical um, space. 
And yes, I'll try to share uh, maybe when we post the uh, recording, we'll be able to add a few uh, background information resources so that we can share that that information. I think that'd be great. Uh, and to help, yeah, address this. It's a big question and mm -hmm. we'll have to see what's out there. And, I mean, if you're going to ask your organization to build in the collection area, they're just going to say no unless you have a good rationale for why it should happen. I think there were a couple of other questions, right? One was for Catherine, but maybe we, let's see if it was already in there. I think it's addressed, but we can certainly read it for the recording and then Catherine's response. Oh, okay. I think it was about uh, uh, connecting with uh, special collections. And mm -hmm. it sounds like you already answered that, Catherine. Yeah. So, you know, it's I, I'm in a sort of odd space in that um, the, the, the space was never supposed to have, special, you know, archives. Um, so, um, and then I think we all know the relationships of minority groups and university special collections, right? And, and whether this materials get processed or not, there are collections that I know that are in Stanford, uh, like the Dr. Uh, uh, Ernesto Galarza materials that, you know, he has a relationship. He had a, he was part of San Jose State. We have a very strong uh, Galarza scholarship here at San Jose State that those materials at Stanford continue not to be processed. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of critique about special collections, uh, the, you know, the more minority collections. Um, so, and the CSUs were never supposed to be special collections. That was UC, right? So, so when the CSU started special collections, um, it was always, of course, collecting either the white faculty collections or the collections and archives of people in the community that had access and, you know, of some monetary value. Uh, minority collections were not in that, that sort of space. So I've, because my space does not have um, archive space, I have had to work as a broker um, to uh, send collections, either to special collections of the university or to the, the public library, which is great for this institution since both of them are, are here in one building. So I've had to collaborate with both public library and the university, depending on the interest and, you know, and uh, sort of focus. Um, so, uh, and then there are things that I've been, I've tried to do in a digital format because that's how I've used like scholar works and, you know, the, um, the D base. So I've, I've had to figure out what I can do within the technology that is in the library, utilizing technology in the library, not technology I've had to ask for, but rather what the university, what the library has made available. So I've re-envisioned some of this technology to be able to do some of the things that I've been uh, wanting to do. So it's taken a little creativity, reimagining, some, some vision. Um, and, and of course, I think given that my space was part of struggle development, I, I kind of think that in my previous things never thought that this space would continue. Um, that there would somehow, there would be an end to this. And then, so why develop it? Why create that kind of space for, for this, for this, um, for this space? So um, that certainly has taken some determination to, to continue and, and again, to, to really bring the library's leadership administration into my own vision and efforts and goals to be, uh, uh, to be accepted. And also to bring the special collection directors into the conversation. So it hasn't been always easy. We're not always on the same line, but um, it's not deterred me. Thank you, Catherine. I know there was a question for Monica and um, uh, Monica addressed it in the chat about the um, Telecuento and if uh, statistics are kept for that program. And the response was, uh, wasn't sure, but uh, if we track ourselves or if it's through CLA, but Monica will definitely check with the library manager to find out for sure. 
I think there was one more question uh, for Jillian about access to listening to the recordings of some of these oral histories. And I don't know. Oh, um, I was trying to find it in the digital archive, but I can definitely get back in touch with um, Professor Rodriguez and also um, Jason Sarmiento to see if they still have it. It was like one of the things that we worked on. I just wanted to mention how happy I was to hear about the, the connections between the Filipino community and the Mexican community and that allies, I think this has come through in all the presentations and all the talks is the importance of allies, the importance of mentoring and, and people that support each other. And I also want to throw a little shout out to Filipino American uh, uh, Heritage Month, which is in October. So that's a, that's our next, I guess our next talk should be on that. <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> um, Kristen, should we do now a quick, uh, just closing remarks around, um, I know we want to talk about some of the upcoming events. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Did you want me to start? Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Um, so for those, many of you know Reforma, have heard the name certainly today on this, um, at the symposium, but for those that don't know that Reforma is the uh, National Association to support uh, Latino and Spanish speaking communities. And you don't need to identify as uh, any of the terms we utilize today, but as long as you support those communities. Uh, and I encourage you to join, but I want to let you know that our um, the national conference is coming up. It's a uh, national conference seven. It will be virtual. It's November 4th through the 7th. And it's Somos El Cambio. We are the change. So I encourage you to register, attend if you can. Uh, I'll put the link in the chat. And then also um, I would like to uh, mention our next upcoming webinar. We just uh, confirmed it all on October 29th at 10 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Mountain, 12 Central, et cetera. Uh, we'll be having a webinar from Denver Public Library. Uh, the Reforma President Nicanor uh, Diaz and uh, one of his colleagues, uh, Nadia, will be speaking about uh, really about collaborations and the successes they've had uh, during Hispanic Heritage Month and the importance of these collaborations and best practices in developing programming around Hispanic Heritage Month. So we'll be sending out information on listservs and social media, so stay tuned for that webinar as well as there's one on November 9th uh, around humble leadership and humble practice, which can go beyond our profession or even our industry. But, uh, and this is a speaker from UNLV in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, a medical librarian that will be speaking about um, humble practice and what that means uh, related to our profession. So stay tuned for those two uh, next upcoming events. That sounds fabulous, Michelle. Thank you for sharing those. Uh, I also just want to say a thank you to every single panel member and our keynote and everyone who joined us today and stuck with us over time. 62 of you are out there. I can see you. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, it really helps us to build our community within the iSchool and do more of that. So uh, thank you to everyone. And uh, I hope we can do more of this stuff. All right, so I guess this is our first uh, Hispanic Heritage uh, Month event, which is now closing. But thanks again, we'll be sharing uh, some links to resources and links to the recording. And we'll make an announcement once we do that so that it's something that's shareable. Uh, to our uh, communities uh, uh, external to the iSchool and SGSU. So take care, everyone, and thank you again. <laughs>